All right, so the purpose of this video is I want to give a quick review of functions. And that might seem a little strange because functions is a topic typically taught in pre-calculus, so you don't hear a whole lot about it being introduced in a calculus class. However, having taught calculus multiple times, I know the importance of this topic, functions. And I also know that depending on when and where you learned about this topic, functions, you may have heard slightly different verbiage that I'm going to use in this class. So in the interest of making things as easy as possible, when we get into some pretty advanced topics in this class, I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing a topic that's maybe not super appropriate for a calculus class, this topic of functions. So what is a function? Well, the way I like to think about it is a function is a mathematical machine. So think like a physical machine right here, right? Maybe there's a conveyor belt leading into this machine and another conveyor belt going out of this machine. And you kind of put the raw inputs in over here and the machine does something to them and then spits out the product over on this side. But this machine is not assembling, I don't know, steel to turn it into, I don't know, some sort of widget. Instead, since it's a mathematical machine, it's taking in numbers like the number, I don't know, three and spitting out other numbers like the number nine. Maybe what this machine does, maybe this is the squaring machine, meaning whatever input you put in gets squared and the output is the square of that number. So three squared equals nine. If I took, I don't know, negative two and fed that into this machine, then the number four would come out. To be clear, I'm talking about numbers going into this machine and numbers coming out of this machine, but the function is not the numbers, it's the machine itself. However, we completely understand that machine if we understand what outputs come from various inputs and what inputs we'd need to achieve various outputs. So while the function is the machine itself, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the numbers that go into the machine and the numbers that come out of the machine, the inputs and outputs of the machine. So how do we represent the machine so that we understand those inputs and outputs? Well, there's several different ways, but two will be really important for our class. The two ways we're gonna represent these functions in our class is with an equation and with a graph. So for example, if my machine were a little bit more complicated than the machine you see pictured up here in purple, if my machine took an input and then squared it, but then subtracted three times whatever that input was, and then subtracted two more, I could write that machine as you see written down here with an equation. I could write f of x equals x squared minus three x minus two. And this would explain to the reader what happens to various inputs to produce other outputs. How does this equation explain all that to the reader? Well, what you need to know is that the X is the input and the F is a letter that's typically used to denote the function. So what the left side of this equation is saying is if I take the input X and put it into this machine, then that is equal to the right side of the equation, which represents the output of the function. This equation is saying that when x is the input, x squared minus 3x minus 2 is the output. And that statement allows me to figure out the output for any input. For example, if I wanted to know what would happen when I put 5 into this machine, well, all I'd have to do is change the input from the letter x to the number 5. So I'd be trying to figure out f of 5. What is that equal to? What happens when my input, the number 5, is put into this machine that I'm calling f. Well, since I know that x squared minus 3x minus 2 is the output when x is the input, then it makes sense that 5 squared minus 3 times 5 minus 2 would be the output when the input is 5. Typically, we don't stop here. We might as well simplify this thing. 5 squared is 25. 3 times 5 is 15. So I got 25 minus 15 minus 2. I got 10 minus 2. I got 8. But the point is just because x squared minus 3x minus 2 is the output when x is the input, 5 squared minus 3 times 5 minus 2 has to be the output when 5 is the input. And since 5 squared minus 3 times 5 minus 2 is just 8, I have this input-output pair 5, 8. And there's nothing special about this 5. This method would work for any input. This equation allows me to figure out the output for any input into this machine. So this equation completely defines this machine. So one of the ways that I'll represent a function is with an equation like this. But that's not the only way. Often you'll see functions represented with graphs. This same function, the same machine f, instead of representing it with an equation, I could just represent it with this graph that you see pictured here in red. 
But wait, I thought you said to understand a machine, you had to understand all the different input and output pairs. How can I use this graph to figure out input and output pairs? How could I figure out, for example, that eight comes out of this machine when I put five into it if I didn't have this equation right here? Well, all you have to do is understand Cartesian coordinates. We have these two different axes. The horizontal axis here is what's called the x-axis, and the vertical axis here is what's called the y-axis. And since we use the letter X to denote the input of the machine, it makes sense that we're going to use the X axis to denote the input of the machine when the machine is given graphically. That leaves the Y axis for the output of the machine. So if I take any point on this graph, like this one right here, who has an X coordinate of five and a Y coordinate of eight, that gives me an input output pair. It tells me that when X is five, Y is eight. And since X is what we use to denote the input of the machine, it tells me when the input is five, the output is eight, the same conclusion we came to over here algebraically. The way I want you thinking about functions in this class is they are these machines, these mathematical machines. And at this point, they're just taking in numbers and spitting out other numbers. And in order to completely understand a machine, you really just need to understand its inputs and its outputs. And the way you can understand its inputs and its outputs is if you were told, the equation of the function, or if you are given the graph of the function. One last thing I want to talk about before we call this video good is some notational stuff. So as I've mentioned, to understand a function, you really need to understand its inputs and its outputs. So kind of at the beginner level, what a typical question would look like when you're involving functions is either you'll be told the input and asked for the output, or sort of the reverse of that, you'll be told the output and you'll be asked to find the corresponding input. And both of those things are entirely possible whether the function is given algebraically or whether it's given by the graph. And neither is all that hard if I'm being honest with you. However, there is a bit of a challenge. These two questions can look really similar. And just understanding what the notation is asking you to figure out. And it's super important that you're able to understand what the notation is asking you to figure out. So when you're told the input and asked to find the output, what a question might look like if we're dealing with the same function f is evaluate is often the verb that you'll see, f of two. And before we even talk about how to figure that out, I want you to compare that with a question that it might ask you to, I don't know, solve could be the verb you see, f of x equals two. Ignoring the English here, the mathematical symbols that you see are fairly similar in green and in red. However, they're asking you to do two completely different things. How do you figure out what they're asking you to do? Well, go back up here to this notation. Remember, the thing in the parentheses right next to the name of the function is the input into the machine. The thing over on the other side of the equal sign is the output. So when I come down here and I'm asked to evaluate f of two, I'm being told that two is the input into this machine. And contrast that with what we see down below where we're being asked to solve f of x equals two. Now, since the two is over on the other side of the equal sign, I'm being told that the two is the output for this machine. So the two typical questions, they look kind of the same, but they're very different. This one, we're being told that two is the input and thus implied is that we're trying to figure out the output. Whereas down here, we're being told two is the output and thus implied is that we're trying to figure out the input. Let's do those two things quickly, algebraically and graphically, and then this video will be done. Evaluate f of two. How are you gonna figure that out? Well, it depends on how the function is presented to you. If the function is presented to you algebraically, then you already know that f of x is equal to x squared minus three x minus two. So evaluating f of two is as simple as changing all the x's in this top expression into the number two. That makes sense. In this expression, x is the input. In this expression, two is the input. If I wanna know the output that corresponds with x, I have it right here. If I wanna know the output that corresponds with two, I have it right here. You could call this the answer, although typically you should simplify things. Four minus six minus two is negative two minus two more. We get negative four as the output when the input is two. If I were asked to evaluate f of two, my answer would be negative four. I could say that f of two equals negative four, and this statement is saying that when the input into this machine f is two, the corresponding output is negative four. Yeah, okay, but what if you didn't have this equation right here? What if all you knew about the function was it's represented by this graph? How would I figure out that an output of negative four corresponds with this input of two? How would I evaluate f of two? 
Well, all you would have to do is come over here on your x axis and figure out where x is equal to 2. It makes sense that you come right here because x is the input in this machine and I want my input to be equal to 2. So I look where on the graph is the x coordinate equal to 2. It looks like that happens down here at this point. This point with an x coordinate of 2 and a y coordinate of negative 4 is on this graph. So that's telling me that this machine f has an output of negative 4 corresponding with an input of 2. Because of this point, I know that f of 2 is equal to negative 4. What about the other question? What about this one where we're asked to solve f of x equals 2? How can I figure that out? Well, again, it depends on whether your function is given algebraically or whether it's given geometrically. If it's given algebraically, then I already know that f of x is equal to x squared minus 3x minus 2. I know that the output is x squared minus 3x minus 2 when the input is x. Now what I'm trying to figure out is what input, what would x have to be equal to in order to make this output equal to 2? Well, that sounds like an equation, right? I know that x squared minus 3x minus 2 is the output, generally speaking, and I know that 2 is the output that I desire. So all I have to do is take this general output, x squared minus 3x minus 2, and set that equal to 2. Make the output 2. If I can solve this equation for x, I figured out what input, remember x is the input, corresponds with an output of 2. How do you solve this equation? Well, at some point in your mathematical background, you probably learned how to solve what are called quadratic trinomials. There's lots of different options, but typically the one that'll serve you the best in this class is to factor. It only helps to factor when your equation is set equal to zero. So what I'm gonna do is first subtract two from both sides of the equation and then factor the left-hand side. When you're factoring a quadratic trinomial with a leading coefficient of one, a lot of jargon there, what you're looking for are two numbers that multiply to give you negative four and add to give you negative three. And you're gonna put those in these two spots here. So let's see, negative four is either negative two times positive two or negative four times positive one or positive four times negative one. But of those pairs, the only way I can sum to negative three is if I put negative four on one side and positive one on the other side. This is the factored form of this equation. This is saying x plus one times x minus four is the exact same as x squared minus three x minus four. If you have a hard time seeing that, you can check your work by going backwards and foiling this out, if that's an acronym you learned at some point. Anyways, I now have something times something equals zero. And that's a really good place to be mathematically because the only way you can multiply together two numbers and get zero as the answer is if one of those numbers itself is zero. So this tells me that either x plus one equals zero or x minus four equals zero. Because if x minus four is zero, I don't care what this is, maybe this is, I don't know, 55. 55 times zero still gives me zero. It wouldn't be 55, but maybe you get the point. So saying that x plus one times x minus four equals zero is the exact same as saying either x plus one is zero or x minus four is zero. x plus one equals zero is saying that x is negative one, and x minus four equals zero is saying x is equal to positive four. Whoa, two different answers, that's weird. No, nah, it's not that weird. It's just saying that there's two different inputs that would lead to this output of two. If I'm asked to solve this equation, I say there's two solutions to this equation, negative one and four. How does that work geometrically? Well, remember up here on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, I got my input. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, I got my output. So when I'm being asked to solve f of x equals two, I'm being told that the output is two. I'm being told that on the y-axis, I wanna have a height of two. Where do I have a height of two on this graph? Well, that happens in a couple different spots. It happens over here, and it also happens over here. This point has an x-coordinate of negative one and a y-coordinate of two. This point has an x-coordinate of four and a y-coordinate of two, from this negative one and this positive four. So even if I didn't know this equation, if I were asked to solve f of x equals two, all I'd have to do is come up here to a height of two and recognize that there's two different points on the graph with that height. One with an x coordinate of negative one, one with an x coordinate of four. And since the x coordinate is the input, and when I'm told the output, I'm implicitly being told to solve for the input, I now have my answer. Solve f of x equals two? Sure, my solution is x equals negative one and x equals four. An important fact that you may remember from when you learned this last time is that if you're told the input, there can only be one corresponding output. However, when you're told the output, there could be more than one input, totally fine. There's my quick review of functions, so I'll call this video good.